and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this Great Decisions event on the Philippines and the United States. Today's speaker, Kanan Solayapan, grew up in Chennai in southern India and earned degrees in Bangalore and in Australia. He moved to Minnesota in 1998 and has been a software consultant here for over 20 years now, working for most of the major companies in Minnesota. The author of the book, Modernity, Civilizations, and the Truth, he lives in Egan with his wife. Today's program is brought to you with the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota, the Foreign Affairs Association, and Global Minnesota. We are deeply grateful to these organizations. The 2020 briefing book, which gives background to all the Great Decisions talks, is available for purchase through the co-sponsoring organization, globalminnesota.org. Because of their generosity, we also have a number of briefing books available for checkout at the library. Before I turn the virtual podium over to Mr. Soliapin, I'd like to talk just a little bit about the technical aspects of this webinar. Today, we are using the Zoom webinar platform. You should see controls either at the bottom of the screen or at the top although they may be hidden until you move your cursor or touch the screen. Although your mic is turned off for this webinar, the chat box is available for you if you need some help with technical issues. You can open the chat box by clicking on the chat balloon icon. If you don't see the chat icon in your control bar, it may be hidden in the ellipses, the three dots. The Q&A box is available for questions on the content of the talk. Feel free to type in your questions at any time throughout the presentation, but we'll ask our speaker to wait until the end of his remarks before he turns to answering the questions. I will read the questions for Mr. Soliapin to answer. You can make use of the closed captioning option to view subtitles for this talk by clicking on the CC button, live transcript button, in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. This program runs for about an hour and a half, including both Mr. Soyapin's presentation and the time for questions. We are recording this event for those who are not able to be present for the webinar. The recording will be made available on our website within a few days. Thanks very much. And now I'd like to turn things over to our speaker, Hanan Soliapin. Thank you, Judy. Thank you very much for those uh, very kind words. Uh, uh, it is indeed a great pleasure for me to be here uh, to talk to you. I would have much liked to have met all of you in person and talked to you. But however, uh, because of the COVID situation, this has to be done uh, you know, through Zoom, uh, I'm no less happy because of that. Uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm glad we are able to do this at all. I have a presentation for you and I will bring it up uh, momentarily and I will walk you through the presentation. Once I am done, uh, I will turn it over to Judy and uh, she will um, turn it over. She will, uh, you know, conduct the Q&A uh, after that as she had already uh, stated. So just a minute. We are uh, talking about the U.S.-Philippines relations today. The United States um, has uh, diplomatic relations with, uh, uh, with uh, several countries. There are 193 countries in the, uh, in the world. And the United States of America has diplomatic relations with, uh, with all of them, with most of them, almost all of them. Um, and, um, you know, um, why is that the Foreign Policy Institute chose the U.S.-Philippines relationship for us to talk about uh, today, uh, you know, uh, for this year? Uh, we have to, why care about the U.S.-Philippines relationship out of all these relationships that the United States has with so many other countries? I think uh, it is because of two reasons. One is the rise of China and the other one is the idiosyncrasies of the current president of the Philippines. Uh, uh, his name is uh, Rodrigo um, uh, Duterte. 
if you had looked into the you know the accompanying uh, magazine that the foreign policy great decisions uh, magazine that the foreign policy uh, institute shares then you would have seen uh, duterte's uh, you would have seen duterte's um, uh, you know a, a, a profile of duterte there uh, but in any case um, that is what makes this relationship uh, important normally when i make uh, presentations what i try to do is i try to go through the the background information uh, you know like uh, r r the historical region that it is that a particular uh, uh, topic is located in and uh, you know the historical background of it the geopolitical forces that are at play um, even moral considerations if they are applicable and the reason I do this is because I find that uh, this gives great context uh, to this, uh, to any topic really. And uh, in the case of what we are talking about today, the US uh, Philippines uh, relationship, you know, it is especially so, so with the uh, rise of China. Uh, so I, I, that's, why, and so I, that's, that's how, you know, if you look at the agenda, that's my, general outline you know talk about the asia pacific region and generally what asia means in general you know uh, because in many ways in the future uh, the relationship between asia and uh, the united states would be uh, um, would w is going to be and the west asia and the west is what is going to determine much of the politics in the coming century so uh, i think we need to talk about that and then I go into the Philippines US relations and then come back again to China and ask uh, what the American response is to China. And then I will turn it over to Julie. So this is the agenda that I just talked to you about for today. Um, why, as already I talked about the why care about uh, the Philippine relationship. And the next is what is this, you know, the Asia Pacific region and the, and, uh, the US Philippine relations. And finally we go to China. So I have a map of Asia here. And this is a map that I got from, because of copyright issues, I got it from the Creative Commons. Okay, so this is the best map I could get of the Asia Pacific region, uh, Asia itself, all of Asia. And here you see in red uh, at the bottom here, um, you know, these are the Southeast Asian countries. One of the uh, striking features of these countries is all of them come from, different civilizations, you know, uh, not, I mean, um, varied civilizations. It's a very multicultural area. If you look at Myanmar, which is Burma, which used to be called Burma or Laos or Thailand or Cambodia, they all get their culture from India. Vietnam and Singapore uh, are Confucian, East Asian Confucian, largely predominantly, though they do have a uh, you know, a Malay and an Indian population They're in Singapore. It's predominantly uh, these two countries are con East Asian Confucian. Malaysia, Indonesia, and Brunei are Muslim countries. And uh, again, predominantly Muslim countries. Um, whereas the Philippines is uh, predominantly uh, Catholic and it gets its culture from, uh, its, uh, you know, its religion and culture from Spain. Uh, so that is the, um, you know, that is, that's the interesting feature about this particular uh, area. And it, uh, you know, it, in many ways, the Asia, the Southeast Asian nations in general, in particular, uh, and uh, generally the Pacific Ocean area, you know, including Australia and uh, New Zealand, you could see that as um, extension of Western civilization. So this area is where civilizations, you know, have extended outward. Uh, otherwise, much else, much of the regions of the world, you find that civilizations are con occupy contiguous areas, you know, uh, large uh, contiguous areas, but it is in this area where they, they you find that they are a, a mix of a lot of different cultures uh, extended throughout history. So that's an interesting aspect. And then uh, if you were to, if you, were, if somebody were to ask me, what is Asia? You know, I would say it, it is compromise. It, it comprises three different civilizations, uh, largely, for, you know, uh, at the Middle East you have, and Central Asia, you have um, the Islamic civilization, which is uh, the Middle East portion of the map is on with is is painted in brown, and uh, the Central Asian portion is in blue. 
whereas the East Asian Confucian countries are all in yellow. Indian subcontinent is in green. Of course, in, you know, Pakistan uh, is more part of the civilization of, uh, of uh, uh, Islam, but it's uh, here they made it as part of the Indian subcontinent in this particular map. So this is the, um, you know, this is the, um, uh, uh, the background, the historical background of Asia. And, uh, you know, uh, one thing, if what is, uh, you, you know, is there, I always ask myself, is there something that unites these three cultures? You know, the India, East, is there anything really um, that unifies India, Asia as a whole? And uh, I have found my answer uh, in Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, so let me go to the next slide. And uh, in 1947, just a few months before India became independent, Gandhi attends an inter-Asian relations conference in New Delhi. And uh, they ask him what Asia, you know, there he speaks about Asia and he gives a con his conception of what Asia is. And, uh, you know, he says the essence of Asia is to be found in, uh, you know, you have a list of very, uh, you know, leading religious uh, figures uh, right in top of my uh, slide, uh, Zoroaster, Moses, Buddha, Jesus of Nazareth and the prophet Muhammad. And he also includes a couple of other uh, whose names are other um, religious figures in India, whose names I have left out because they, and you know, because they're not pro prominently known outside of India. And he says their common message is the message of love and all of them are in, uh, you know, are located in Asia. And he argues that even Moses, though he was originally from uh, Egypt, he belongs more to Palestine and belongs to Asia and their message, their common message is one of love and truth. And, uh, you know, Asia should offer this, where, this message of love and truth, if we, you know, as a response to the West's uh, reliance on atomic weapons. And, uh, it, we, you know, it can conquer, not with weaponry, but with uh, love and truth, Asia can conquer. He even goes on to say that Asia can conquer the West. And he says uh, the West will really actually likes being conquered through love and truth. But unfortunately, uh, that is not what we see is as uh, the Asia in the Asia today. Uh, it, at least it's not self-evident, uh, clearly, as we see, we'll see in the next slide. Uh, the political reality of Asia today is based on uh, two things. One is identity. It's all, all politics in Asia today is identity politics. India is a democracy. China has a, a communist party that runs it. But behind that, it is nationalism that, uh, you know, uh, that that we see in all their politics. Otherwise, it's just pragmatism. Uh, it's just uh, nationalism and the same thing that identity politics in the Middle East and all the fighting is about identity politics. And one of the things with identity politics is identity is inseparable from this concept of destiny. Um, so uh, they have, uh, and these countries have in Asia have uh, claims, you know, traditions of Asia have, have, some of them run for millennia and they have sweeping claims making, so they make sweeping claims on behalf of their traditions and, uh, uh, and they are willing to run wild risks, uh, you know, are, are, if not willing, at least have clearly expressed a willingness in the in live in modern uh, times that is in living memory, uh, they have uh, expressed a r willingness to run wild risk to achieve their uh, goals. Uh, Mao was willing to said, you know, the nuclear weapons were uh, a paper tiger. And uh, he was willing to sacrifice uh, millions of lives when he was alive. Uh, in, during, in 1999, in the Kargil standoff, India was prepared to lose, uh, you know, three times as much lives in a complete, um, if there were to be a nuclear standoff between the two countries. Um, and Clinton had to face the Pakistani prime minister down and cool tempers. Uh, when he was president. And finally, um, the Islamists in the Middle East are also willing to run similar risks. So this is, uh, and I, and when I look at the history of these uh, countries, you know, it seems to be that it's more a modern phenomenon, this kind of willing, they, you know, they had social oppression and, and uh, violence and wars and conflict in the past, but uh, the kind of, um, 
a willingness to make human sacrifices on this scale in Asia is a very, uh, and a repression, some of the repression techniques that they use all seem to be very uh, modern. You know, I, I, I read, uh, you know, the um, famed uh, uh, scholar of Middle Eastern studies, uh, uh, Bernard Lewis, he says, uh, um, Saddam Hussein, uh, learned some of his repression techniques uh, by studying Western dictators. There was no president uh, on a similar scale of repression. There was no uh, president in their own history. It was something that he picked up from uh, studying Mussolini and Hitler. So this seems to be a very modern phenomenon in Asia today. So having done all with the background, let's go to the uh, U.S.-Philippines relation itself, and uh, let me try and cover first the colonial era. Uh, in 1898, uh, the Philippines became an American colony. Actually, um, at the end of the American Spanish-American War, there was a treaty that uh, the, Sp the Spanish signed with the uh, with America, and uh, they handed over uh, this is called the Treaty of Paris, and they handed over the Philippines along with Puerto Rico and Cuba to, uh, you know, uh, came to America at the time. And um, in the Philippines, um, you know, there was an indigenous uh, movement for the for independence at the time from the Spaniards, and they were really looking forward. If they they thought if the Americans take over and win the Spanish. Uh, they would they could become free, but uh, America had, didn't have uh, didn't want to give up uh, a, you know the colony and uh, so it it it, it through it used force uh, and it managed to bring uh, the independ independence movement um, into the into the uh, political uh, sphere you know uh, brought them into. Um, the color into the color and you know from being a fighting force it brought them it pacified them and partly militarily and partly diplomatically it, it succeeded in doing that and uh, it was uh, you know and when it uh, when that happened there were it was not a ma small movement there were 100,000 Filipinos who were attached to this cause of uh, uh, independence so there was a certain amount of resentment when uh, the Philippines became a colony uh, but America, to be fair, America uh, promised uh, self-government, uh, and it wanted uh, it, it. It saw itself in some sort of paternalistic role. It tried to increase. It, it actually increased uh, Filipino participation in the government. Uh, the colonial administration tried to uh, promote education, particularly. There was big strides made in education during the colonial period, but there was very limited social and economic uh, reforms. For instance, hardly any land redistribution, and the local elite continued to. Uh, keep uh, the um, ma masses, uh, you know, as uh, workers, farm workers, they had nothing further to look forward to. The transfer of power took place in 1935, um, uh, except defense and foreign policy, uh, you know, um, the country became independent then. The idea was to transition to full independence in by uh, 1946. However, what happened was the second uh, world war came and uh, uh, that uh, that changed the circumstances changed completely as a result of that. As let's go to the next slide. See, in World War II is important in the U.S.-Philippines relations. Uh, Quezon, um, you know, who was who became the president of Philippines, appointed Douglas MacArthur, who was in 1935, after the um, Philippines became independent at least within the Commonwealth, uh, to uh, build an army up so that they are ready to take over when the Americans leave and defend their country. Uh, Douglas MacArthur started to train the Filipinos and uh, then what happened was it uh, uh, the World War II broke out and uh, America um, had some troops there and the Air Force there and it was all put under MacArthur's command. 
Uh, after Pearl Harbor, within a matter of 24 hours, the Japanese managed to completely neutralize the American, you know, uh, hugely damaged, great damage, created, made, made great damage to the, in their, in their attacks from uh, their bases in Formosa, which is today's Taiwan. They uh, attacked the American Air Force and completely, you know, uh, significantly destroyed it. And uh, MacArthur had to move out to Bataan and uh, then he uh, uh, leaves on PT boats to um, when it became uh, you know to to Mindanao from where he flew into Australia and arrived at Melbourne where he made his famous speech that he shall that I shall return speech uh, allied invasion of Philippines MacArthur uh, led the allied invasion of Philippines and reconquered the Philippines but uh, in Bataan itself uh, the Japanese took the um, uh, Filipinos as prisoners. But this is a very important seminal moment in the US-Filipino relationship. America really uh, secured the uh, protection of uh, the Philippines from uh, the Japanese invasion in 1940, uh, in, in, in the 1940s. And Philippines became independent in 1946. After that, um, there was a, you know, the, the US-Filipino rela relationship became a very strategic relationship. It was a very, it was a military, there was a huge military component to the US-Filipino, re Philippine re relationship. Uh, in, 19, in 1947, a basis, military basis agreement was signed. Uh, two major bases uh, existed in the Philippines during the Cold War years. Um, especially after World War II, these were, um, you know, um, these were uh, greatly developed. One is the Clark Airfield and the Subic Bay uh, Naval Facility. Uh, these were, uh, you know, there, uh, there, there were streaks of nationalism uh, that, that happened, that took place in the Philippines, which, uh, which, you know, and that was responsible for uh, streaks of nationalism where what it did was it, uh, you know, they wanted back the bases in the 1960s, the Filipinos, see Philippines had a, uh, has a kind of um, strange kind of relationship in the United States. It's heavily dependent on the United States, but it does not want to be identified uh, emotionally entirely on the United States. Uh, it uh, it wants to assert its independence. Uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't want to be seen as a Christian outpost in Asia. So uh, so that creates a certain amount of uh, time strain from time to that assertion creates a certain amount of strain. So they scale back the uh, the basis treaty to 25 years from 19, uh, 99 years in the 60s and the 70s uh, when Mao, um, when Marcos became the president, there was, a, a, they, they were harking back, the nationalists were looking into pre-Spanish sources of Filipino culture to self-identify with you know, rather than the Spanish period, they wanted to have uh, to be something original. So uh, that assertion uh, was kicking in. And uh, after, uh, during the, the Clark Airfield and the Subic Na Bay Naval Facility was ex were very useful for America strategically during the end of the Cold War. I mean, do the, during the end of the uh, Korean War, Air Force, uh, you know, air fly, uh, uh, American planes were, uh, you know, be from the Kark airfield were used in the Korean Peninsula. And likewise, um, they were also used in, Viet in the Vietnam War also, these uh, facilities were greatly useful. So it was, it filled, it did its job during the Cold War. And after the Cold War was over, the Filipinos wanted to scale it back and the facilities were closed, uh, you know, in uh, 1992. Um, the um, America turned over the facilities to uh, the Filipino authorities, and the and the cost of, um, you know, the value of these facilities that were turned over to the Filipino government was non-trivial. It was 1.3 billion dollars uh, a, a value. The assets value were uh, 1.3 billion dollars, and. Uh, then what happened in 90, after 92, um, 
the a visiting forces agreement was signed uh, between uh, the Philippines and the United States in 1998, and it was in, it went into um, you know uh, effect in 1999, whereby American troops uh, could um, use uh, the uh, could um, uh, facilities in the Philippines, build facilities for their own use, extend them. So there was a that that went into effect and that has been in effect ever since um we will come to that when we go to uh, talk about rodrigo uh, duterte well, we will we will go in and examine that a little bit more and some of the issues that have crossed cropped up in the recent past uh, and in 2014 there was a enhanced defense cooperation agreement between the two countries that was signed uh, 2014 and this was the this agreement, uh, one of the salient features of this agreement, one of the important features of this agreement was that no nuclear weapons ought to be bulled and both countries um, have to have, uh, you know, no nuclear weapons have, can be installed or kept in any of the Filipino uh, bases or anywhere. Nuclear um, weapons carrying nuclear weapons should not be uh, landed in the Philippines. So those kind of things were put into effect. And uh, um, so this, uh, this was this agreement uh, came into effect in 2014. Uh, so the relationship generally, you know, um, has been kind of, um, you could say it was large, it's centered on a military relationship. Uh, it's strategically important for the United States, um, especially with uh, uh, the rise, you know, uh, with the rise of uh, the different countries in Asia, um, you know, China and the other countries, the rise of Asia, it is, it's becoming more important. So let's uh, go on and see what, uh, what is the recent controversy with uh, the personality of Rodrigo Duterte. He becomes president in uh, 2016 and uh, he is idiosyncrasies of this man has contributed um, to some degree, you know, to the crisis in the relationship. He, he was a victim uh, of child, uh, of sexual abuse. You know, he'd been to a Catholic school and during um, his um, uh, confessions, one of the priests uh, in the school had, uh, had uh, you know, uh, had uh, abused him sexually and uh, Eventually, this was uh, the the uh, the society, the Catholic society, the Salesian society, had uh, had made a settlement um, uh, in California for certain uh, uh, sexual uh, uh, abuses carried out by this particular priest in uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, certain millions of running into millions of dollars, a settlement was made, and I think that uh, that probably forms the background of what. Uh, Duterte has gone on to become, you know, he, he was, uh, when he was mayor for almost two decades, he is, uh, tries to play the strong man kind of uh, thing, you know, he resorted to extrajudicial killings uh, when, when he was mayor of the city of Dao, it comes from the island of Mindanao, um, and he became president in 2016. He is a populist, he's a nationalist, and one of his, uh, policy uh, decisions in 2016 was to tilt to China and to Russia. Um, and he actually used uh, offensive language uh, um, in reference to President Obama. And uh, he was supposed to meet President Obama when uh, they were in Laos during an international conference and President Obama canceled uh, the meeting with this uh, guy. Um, and what he did is, um, you know, early this year in February, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a notice that came out saying that the government is going to can cancel the visiting forces agreement. Uh, and it came out in February 2020. But in June of this year, within a matter of months, that was uh, the cancellation was canceled. You know, that was abrogated. So uh, we one thing that we find is that, um, 
you know he is a sort of whimsical guy he you know he 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 likes to play the tough guy the nationalist card and uh, he's not really uh, uh, guided by uh, te- uh, by uh, notions of decency and stuff but but he did um, he did cancel the uh, visiting forces agreement uh, he wanted to cancel it, but he couldn't cancel it. See, the relationship is so deep that uh, he, that he, one particular individual, no matter what his uh, idiosyncrasies are, and the reality of the situation in the Philippines is such that um, he, one man cannot significantly, fundamentally alter this relationship. And that is what I think about uh, Duarte. Duterte. And let me go on to the next slide. Um, the What is the state of the US-Philippines relations, right? There are certain data points that I'd like to give you um, to stress what this relationship is at the moment and, uh, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, how involved this relationship is. Nearly 4 million um, Americans, U.S. citizens of, you know, there are 4 million U.S. citizens of Filipino ancestry in the United States, more than 350,000 U.S. citizens uh, living in the Philippines currently. Every year, um, 650,000 U.S. citizens visit the Philippines. Uh, The largest veteran, uh, I mean, uh, sorry, the the Veterans Administration Regional Office, there is only one Veterans Administration Regional Office outside the United States, and that is in Manila. Um, and that tells you, uh, you know, how much the uh, veterans in the United States are attracted uh, to go back and live in uh, in the Philippines, people who have fought in that area or have lived in that area. And so, quite a few of them, I said, you know, there are 350,000 U.S. citizens. Quite a few of them had have um, uh, taken spouses from the from the from the Philippines. So um, it's a, it's a very deep relationship. And the and finally, the largest, uh, you know, the uh, American military cemetery outside the United States is in Manila. So uh, it is uh, in to sum it. I think it's a uh, it's too deep a relationship, and uh, Philippines, uh, you know, they don't. Uh, the given the political reality in the region, uh, you could posture, but I don't think, as of yet, you could say that the Philippines is uh, bandwagoning with China. See, two things with the rise of China, two things that uh, countries can do: either they can bandwagon with China or they can oppose China. I don't think uh, that the Philippines or any other country in the region as of yet is bandwagoning with China. Uh, There are uh, countries that are defiant of China though, and that is uh, Japan, Vietnam, India, and uh, you know, uh, and Australia, they are, uh, if, when I say de- defiant, what I mean is that they are not op- in open defiance, but they are very uh, openly wary and concerned about the rise of China. And, uh, and in the case of Japan and, and maybe even Australia, and you know, they are, ex- they've expressed, uh, there, there have been some, uh, uh, some expression on the Chinese side too of claims in the Philippines and uh, claims that have been made and the relationship, uh, you know, uh, has not been entirely smooth. Occasionally it's been bumpy and that, that has made uh, some of these countries uh, nervous in that particular region. So let me go on. I tend to think, now we're going to talk about China and uh, one of the things that uh, I, I tend to think that the world must ask, it's not just the United States, must ask five questions about China. And that is, what is China's long-term intention? China plays its cards too close to its chest. It, is a, it has a communist party that rules the country, but uh, you know it has a capitalist economic system. They have this picture of Chairman Mao in the center of the Tiananmen Square, but just away in Beijing, just away in Shanghai, they have a, a, a stock exchange. Um, in uh, in uh, uh, you know, I don't know how uh, Chairman Mao would react to the 
Shanghai Stock Exchange, but these are contradiction and uh, contradictions, uh, very self-evidently so. And uh, so we are not able to really say what China's long-term intentions are, but what is China's, but China has always seen herself as the middle kingdom situated at the center of the world and other nations as tributary paying barbarians. Now, uh, one reasonable questions that a question that uh, scholars and uh, think tanks and uh, politicians, uh, you know, uh, uh, must uh, and journalists must uh, responsibly ask. You know, it's a very responsible thing to ask: uh, is whether China will seeks to bring such a world into existence. Is that the vision that they? Uh, you know, you, do they want to realize the historical vision all along? You know, if you look at the 19th century, when a uh, period of European dominance, when the colonial powers are trying to extract concessions out of China d during the Qing dynasty, uh, they are far more easily and willingly ready to, you know, willing to give concessions um, than to, you know, but they want obeisance. They want... Uh, the uh, the diplomat, the European diplomat to now tow uh, the Chinese emperor and they go to all extents to try to make that happen. Um, you know, and and this uh, this you see even in the modern era, it's not, you know, some of these, uh, some of the assertions that the China uh, is involved in uh, uh, is an outplay of, you know, it's it comes out of that. But, you know, see, China is in a, but the international system is made up of independent nations, at least as a matter of principle, every, the ruler of every country uh, is uh, is equal to the ruler of every other country. I mean, in the smallest African country, uh, president comes to America or Russia or uh, England, uh, they have to be treated protocol wise as equals and they are treated as equals uh, from a protocol standpoint. So this is completely, uh, 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 you know, a out of tune, diametrically opposite to China's historical experience. And that creates, I think, a, a lot, uh, you know, uh, that creates a lot of uh, issues in China. And, uh, and so that's why I think that question is important. People should ask this question. Then I think, uh, you know, if China, want, if that is the, uh, if what is this historical vision, this sense of tributary system? Now, um, you know what is what does it mean morally? You know why should people um, who are in smaller countries, which are poorer or which are weaker, why should they genuflect? Why should they? Uh, you know, it's it's a moral thing, and uh, so we have to you know that we have to raise among. I mean, the rest of the world has to raise that moral question. And say, uh, is we you know what is it morally? Can we do this? We just cannot. We cannot do this. You know this. This is not acceptable to us. We are not going to do this anytime in the future. Now that that sort of communication and that sort of engagement with this historical vision is completely absent in the in the uh, the wider global um, arena. And um, also, you know, one other thing about China is its, histor its historical vision. Is that historical vision, is it pertinent to the condition of the world today? Is this Chinese historical vision? They are the emperor and surround, you know, they are the rest of the countries are all um, going to China to pay tribute and uh, their, their emperor is the ruler of the world. Is that pertinent to the world. Uh, you know, I, I said morally, that's a problem. But historically, you know, when I look at it, when I look at countries in Africa and uh, the third world and uh, in many of the countries in the third world and their ability to, inability to come to terms with modernity, um, you know, they, they, they may, you know, down the line, um, there could be a rationalization. You know, the, this is not 
uh, we some sort of parentalism, you know, some sort of paternalism. Um, we're, not, we're not going to be barbarians, but uh, this vision of, uh, you know, if people cannot help themselves in the most basic way in the third world, is that a model? I'm not saying that the rest of the world should go and genuflect before China, but some sort of new United Nations or something with, which will really try and uh, play that kind of role so that the dignity of the different nations are not uh, trampled with at the at but at the same time the benefits of modernity the fruits of modernity the same high quality education the same high quality uh, uh, health care transportation facilities and possibilities in life that are available in the developed world is available to the rest of the world is that is that and now uh, when we engage with this question we we can you know we we can think about uh, a, a, a some kind of an alternate way by which this can be fulfilled see uh, if so one of the things that's happening is this people in the rest of the world don't engage with this historical vision of china uh, in in a wholesome fashion, they just want to, you know, in the next slide, we will see as we go on and what the US response is to this, to China is. And uh, um, as we go on in the subsequent slides, but we don't, there's a general option, absence of a willing, you know, a sort of willingness to engage with this historical Chinese vision. Um, most of the time it's about how to contain China, how to move troops and can we fight or can we, if what they do, what would we do if they invade Taiwan or uh, what would we do if, you know, how are we going to, uh, uh, correct the trade imbalances. This is the kind of uh, a narrative that's going on because uh, this is the kind of discussion that goes on in foreign policy circles. Uh, see, my uh, concern is there are, there are smart people on the Chinese side and they might think that there is an opportunity for them to play in the world uh, if this question is not addressed. Uh, and I think, uh, that that's where you know uh, and so we must engage with them and, and uh, morally and historically uh, engage not directly with them but with the with the basic premises uh, you know argument so that we could uh, we could try and achieve um, a better world uh, without the loss of dignity and self-respect for other nations in the world. Uh, now, if does China have the resources to realize its history? This is the final question I had. You know, can China bring this world about? Can it realize it? Does it have the strength to, you know, make uh, the rest of the world subdue uh, China? I mean, can it subdue the rest of the world, so to speak? I see. Uh, I believe that China does have the resources to. Uh, fundamentally disturb the international order as it exists in the world today. I indeed, it is the only country that may be able to do that. China has, so the Russia has a lot of nuclear weapons, but Russia has even from the Soviet days uh, has never been able, you know, it does not have, does not have is not willing to run risks. You saw the Cuban Missile Crisis, they backed down. So the Russians usually uh, don't want a confrontation with the West, but China, we don't know. It plays its cards too, too close to its chest. We don't know. Uh, uh, so will it, uh, you know, if it challenges uh, the rest of the world, uh, you know, it can disturb the fundamental, in a fundamental way, in a profound way, it can disturb the existing order. But I don't believe it does have the resources to create its, uh, realize its vision, uh, you know, um, because why would, for instance, why would Japan or why would India or why would Australia or why would Europe or uh, the rest of the world, uh, you know, they have to get, you know, what is it that they get for them to accept China, Chinese preeminence, so to speak. So, but these are important questions and in the public sphere, I think it's important that we engage with it. Let me go on to the next slide. Uh, what is the, the prospective, what are the U.S., resp what has been the U.S. responses to China? Um, Trump's response, you know, he's a deal maker and he wants to make, uh, do things bilaterally. Uh, the establishment's response, yes, this was what um, 
President Obama spoke of as the uh, as the uh, uh, as the pivot to Asia, you know, series of options are available. Um, can create more military bases. Uh, some of them are can have formal or informal alliances. They, uh, tra the TPP came into existence when Obama was president, but uh, uh, Trump pulled the, uh, the United States from the TPP and. Uh, uh, the, so the you know the idea was to create preferential trading blocks by excluding China. Uh, Nancy Pelosi has this idea of raising human rights issues with China, and uh, and there are um, you know already people talking about uh, uh, helping uh, China's neighbors, which are uh, willing to resist China. So these, are, but but then the final option that the United States has in the case of a major Chinese transgression is a massive nuclear American, massive American nuclear retaliation. That is the horrendous situation. Now, uh, that's something unless we know uh, whether China will, uh, you know, uh, that it, that is that is the that is a real horrendous situation for the world, and uh, you know, uh, that is the final option that that the United States has. Um, so I, I, I don't think, you know, what the Chinese try to do from time to time is try to um, try to play this, um, you know, or try to create awe in the minds of their uh, other nations uh, with their, uh, you know, uh, even in with Duterte, you see one of his, uh, uh, one of his photograph, one of the photographs, the Filipino president and Duterte and uh, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, I, I saw. Uh, he is, is, you know, in uh, Duterte is actually walking a few steps behind Duterte. In, uh, you know, Duterte is walking behind uh, Xi Jinping, a few steps behind Xi Jinping as some kind of marker of uh, difference to the, you know. So this is something that they, uh, the, the Chinese, uh, uh, try to extract from others, uh, like you know, difference and that sort of thing. But but I, I you know, uh, 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 differ. But but you know, there, uh, see that's they can. But I don't believe that they can fundamentally uh, create the order that the historical vision of themselves through this kind of difference. You know, uh, not too many people will go along with that sort of thing. Um, so let's go back to, so what can the ideal res global response be? You know, I, I think all civilizations are holding on to a certain piece of the truth, you know. Uh, so only by, uh, uh, by engaging with that, with these, uh, the different claims of these civilizations and coming to some kind of equitable uh, solution you, we can, uh, we can, uh, we can diffuse the situation. You know, we cannot, uh, I don't think it's possible to, to have a, and you know, the, as long as the scale of confrontation is small in the Filipino islands, and if we're talking about, uh, you know, China's claims for Senkyaku or uh, with Japan or with uh, the Philippines, another island with the Philippines, or it's about the South China Sea and uh, territorial waters, you can, you can try and work them out or at least, uh, you know, keep the status quo going. But if, if the risks, if China runs, the, the real danger moment comes when if China is going to run the risk, you know, international risk, a major risk. Now, that that is the real uh, worrisome situation. And that is something entirely uh, a, at this remote a Chinese prerogative. We don't, you know, we have, we are not privy to that. Uh, but we need to talk about it. And uh, one way by which we, you know, by preempting it, the discussion, by talking about it in public, by engaging with the aspirations, uh, even those that are, um, that are con contradictory to the existing world order, uh, we may be able to, um, you know, uh, uh, we may be able to come up with some kind of moral alternative uh, for the world. And that's basically what I'm saying here uh, in, the, in these, uh, you know, uh, in, in these, uh, in this particular slide. 
So, um, so this is where I would, uh, you know, this is where I would leave it. I, I probably have a few minutes. I just had, uh, I, uh, you know, I have a few minutes extra here. I could probably turn it over to Judy at this stage and uh, uh, take questions from you. You know, I, I mean, you, you might, many of you might not have uh, come prepared for, they would have thought about it as a mere Filipino-US relationship rather than the wider uh, thing. But I always think that we bring more uh, by, by delving into topics that are surround the main issue. Uh, if they are significant, as it is in this case, we would we bring the discourse to a to a, a higher and deeper level, and uh, and that enriches the discussion. I think so. Let me turn it over to Judy, and uh, I will await your questions. All right. Well, thank you very much. We do have a question, and I'm also going to say to the audience at this point: now is your chance to uh, type in your questions in the Q and A column for our speaker. Uh, but there's one here already, and that is, uh, what could be the possible benefit to the developed Western world in allowing China to achieve its historical world view? Uh, that's, a, that's a splendid uh, question. That's a splendid question. You know, there is, I'm not saying that you should allow China to uh, achieve its historical worldview. I'm only saying as the rest of the world, not just the Western world, should try to engage with it, you know, maybe through, see, because the idea is the, the benefit that the West gets is it can, it can, uh, it can avert a military confrontation with China. See, that is the, not, I'm and not, I, I, not, I'm not saying go and, uh, I love their historical, fulfill their historical vision. No, that's not what I'm saying. Indeed, I'm saying that would be, you know, nobody won, no, none of the, in my view, none of the third world countries, regardless of how poor they are and how helpless they are, they should not go to a developed country, particularly uh, one where the traditional narrative looks, has looked down at them as barbarians and uh, go and uh, uh, submit meekly uh, for dominance or anything like that. They shouldn't do that. Uh, their honor of a nation is more important than all the material benefits that it can get. I, I'm just raising this, the decibel level associated with China's historical vision so that there is no, um, you know, we, we have, because I want the question to be raised before uh, any sort of major confrontation between the West and China takes place. What I would like to see happen is some kind of United Nations that that fulfills the role rather than any specific uh, nation, you know, and America can take responsibility as it has already, take responsibility and be the backbone of the United Nations effort in some kind of paternalistic involvement in the developed world uh, to help them uh, raise the standard of living and, uh, you know, um, re bring about global e equality in terms of the fruits of modernity uh, can be at the back and, you know, it's, it'll be a noble achievement and it can help diffuse the confrontation with uh, China because, because you see, the last point I say, if the U.S. achieves this, possibly through the auspices of the United States Nations before it's too late, China will not have a moral purpose and a global, conf a global confrontation can be avoided. I mean, I'm, what I am concerned about is not these small scale assert assertions that China is engaged in. What I'm concerned about is, um, is avoiding, uh, you know, um, a major confrontation. If, we, if after a confrontation, we create something you know, uh, and if it is possible for us to create the same thing without the confrontation, isn't that more advantageous? So why shouldn't you, uh, why not wrestle with it uh, ahead of time? That's, that's my case here. All right, uh, we'll go on to the next question. Are the Philippines better off adopting a neutralist stance vis-a-vis -vis China rather than being so closely allied with the U.S.? Uh, considering the risks that could pose. Well, that's, that is possibly what they are doing. And, uh, you know, see, this depends upon, ultimately, this comes down to American resolve, you know. 
uh, if America, if, the, if there is a realistic chance of that America will, will uh, defend them, then uh, they are going to, uh, they are, see, uh, the countries that are, that are really, the ones that are weaker are the ones that are not really uh, so weaker. When I say weaker, it's not just uh, militarily, but also psychologically weaker are the ones that are really standing on the fence, really. It's not, you know, you don't find Malaysia really trying to be defiant or Indonesia trying to be, you know, you find this coming more from uh, Vietnam or which is for already fought a war with China in 79. Uh, it comes from uh, India. It comes from Japan. It comes from, you know, you don't find the smaller countries uh, which are psychologically at least weaker are not uh, willing to uh, uh, willing to defy or oppose China really at the moment. They're sitting on the fence at the moment. So I mean, it, they they are not. They will not. De they, they will not declare, but uh, openly neutral neutrality unless they are under much more pressure from China. But at the moment, they are uh, just watching, sitting on the fence. And if America is going to um, stop China, they will support America. That's that would you know, no nation wants to give up its independence. Right, they want to keep their independence, and so uh, they will try to help. But if America doesn't prevail, then they will bandwagon. They are Eastern countries, so they have to survive. So they will bandwagon with China. All right. Um, this questioner wants to know: Can you speak to China's increasing influence in Africa? Well, uh, again, see, uh, there is a lay, there is a scholar at Yale, you know, she's a graduate student at Yale and she has done some uh, field work and she was invited as part of a lecture series at Yale given by Professor Ian Shapiro to present China's case in Australia, in Africa, China's role in Africa. And, uh, you know, she has done field work and it's fairly recent. And what she says is um, China does, is involved in Africa. Uh, there are some countries, uh, China is, of course, in, you know, it gives foreign aid to Africa. It gives, uh, um, it is involved in commercial enterprises. It's in, it builds roads, railways, whatnot, infrastructure projects. It bids for them and does it for them. And it also uh, gets resources, raw materials from different countries. The countries that are, there are countries in Africa that have had a past experience with China. These countries are able to get better bargains, better deals, you know, former socialist countries or former countries that have had closer relationship, even during the Maoist period, they had close relay or uh, Deng Xiaoping, you know, before China really moved into Africa, these countries have had relationships. And they've, they are able to get good deals from China, countries like Tanzania and Ethiopia. Whereas um, if you look at countries like, um, uh, if you look at countries like um, uh, 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 Nigeria or Kenya, which didn't have that kind of relationship, they find it difficult to have uh, that kind of relationship, uh, you know, the benefit from it. They are the ones who are complaining about uh, China's dominance there or uh, because they, you know, they've not learned how to some way or the other learned how to uh, deal with China, so to speak. All right, the next question uses a geographical term that I'm not familiar with, so I apologize in advance uh -huh. if I mispronounce this. It, it is a city name, I presume, in the Philippines. Uh, the question is, is Olongapo still the wide open city it was in 1970? Oh, I really do. I, I really don't know. You know, I am not an expert in Philippine affairs. Let me confess. I was, I was, you know, the, the it's rather surprising. Um, you know, the great decisions, uh, P folks, they didn't have uh, a, a speaker for the U.S. Philippines initially. So uh, I had given a list of topics that I would uh, be willing to talk on and uh, the organizer, the convener asked me, do you want to do US uh, Philippines? I thought about it and I said, well, it gives me an opportunity to talk about China, you know? So I, I'll take it up. And that's how I landed up with this. I think, uh, you know, I, I, I honestly don't know. 
the answer to this. Well, if, if one of the other viewers has any information or even the correct pronunciation sure, why not? Why of not? the city's name, please type in the information. I at least want to know how to pronounce the <laughs> name of Olongopo, but we'll move on at the moment. All right, we hear about the expansion of the Silk Road into India, Africa, and Europe. Yes. What can you tell us about that and what are your opinions? Okay, uh, see, the, so this Silk Road is, um, you know, um, the history behind the Silk Road is this is in the post-Mongol period after Genghis Khan and all the brutality. What happened was it was a period of great, uh, 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 you know, trade relationship between uh, Asia and the West. And the Silk Road was very central to that. Uh, the Chinese wanted to revive that and uh, the same concept and they started building uh, uh, railways and roads to reaching up to the edge of Europe. You know, that's, that is the plan behind this Silk Road. They see, they are trying to uh, uh, see, they are, well, I mean, I, the more I think about it, the more I get the feeling that they are trying to, um, you know, uh, to create awe around their, uh, grandeur around their uh, uh, around their uh, 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 country and their nation and their uh, and their culture and uh, and all that you know they try to awe other nations into uh, into a superior uh, you know kind of status quo get try and get a superior status quo that's that's the way the evidence points to I'm not saying what their long term intentions are going to be but that's what the evidence points to. Uh, and oh, this is one such effort. If you watch the Olympics, you know, there were, on the opening day celebration, you had one guy who was almost flat. The, you know, he was, uh, he was lying down and he was walking on the walls in the Beijing Olympics when it happened. He was actually walking upside. I mean, he was not walking upside down. He was walking on the walls of the stadium. Uh, with his uh, uh, with his long shoes, he was uh, you know. So this was that was a show trying to uh, symbolism, you know, trying to show that they can do the impossible. Their rise has been spectacular, you know. Their their growth has been phenomenal, but I don't. But I don't see. But I think this uh, Silk Road approach. Uh, it it does take a lot of material from one part of the. You know, most of these countries are not. Uh, don't have that kind of infrastructure. It provides raw materials back and forth to China. But I think it, it is just that they have surplus money, surplus wealth, and they want to spend it in something uh, uh, really grand. And they are doing these kinds of things to, uh, you know, uh, uh, create a sense of grandeur and nationalism. So it's, it's, it's nationalism through and through that comes through all these things, I think, in China. Okay, and now we'll turn back for the next question to the Philippines. Okay. Do you consider the Philippines to be a developing country in need of surplus from the U.S. or China? Well, you know, see, I go by two indices. There are two indices that I look at, you know. One, uh, one is the Human Development Index, and the other is... Um, the uh, Freedom House, you know, uh, the United Nations uh, Development Program has uh, something called as an outfit called as Freedom House, and they come out annually, you know, or every year and a half or a year or so, they come out with reports on the state of freedom in the world. They give you a value for every country. And if you look at that, either from a development standpoint, you know, uh, Philippines is is sort of in the uh, you know uh, country in terms of development. It is it's probably um, doing a little better than the rest of the world, but it's not a. They don't regard it as a highly developed country. No, they don't. Uh, they it comes across as a developed country. Now the classification has seeped in because of the last thirty years or so the development. The you know they they're still using the same indexes. Relative terms, I don't think 
the Philippines is is sort of like a developed country in the first world sense of the term. Uh, but but short of that, it's a it's a I would say it's a middle middle income country. I would say, and in terms of democracy, its performance is even uh, even bad. The democracy is you know for instance, I come from India. India's scores for democracies are is is a lot better than what the Philippines score. Uh, for democracy is, you know, like the civil civil rights and the uh, political political rights and civil liberties. They have two indicators for that, and uh, Philippines does badly. Developed, yes, a little bit more uh, on the development side, but it's you know middle income country. No, I wouldn't consider it. See, the uh, Philippines does not really produce. See, they, I, what I look for in addition to it is, uh, is there something that they are able to do in the world that the world wants. You see, um, you, you, in the same way that uh, you could find Israel, for instance, is able to do things over and above raw materials and processing and that sort of thing, or some kind of, uh, you know, garment manufacture or cheap labor in that sort of sense. Over and above that, are they able to do something that the world wants, uh, something of value, like, you know, uh, there are software in Southern India, for instance, or design centers in Southern India, or uh, a manufacture of very fine, finer products in China, you know, uh, see, uh, there is this guy, uh, Apple CEO, uh, you know, Tim Cook, he says, in China, it is not the price of the labor that attracts companies there. It's the skill of the workmanship that attracts people there. So I look for something extra. And I'm not sure I see a whole lot in the Philippines in that sense. They have, it's a small population, not my, you know, uh, raw materials and whatnot, and they do agriculture and it's a middle income country, but I don't see a lot uh, in terms of Filipinos doing there are they have a lot of immigrant workers from the Philippines working in the in the Middle East and repatriating money back home. So all these are uh, useful, you know, uh, is what moves the economy and that's fine. But I look for something extra over and above that and I don't find that in the Philippines really. All right. And the next question, I think you have to some degree addressed this, but perhaps you have other material to add. Is there a movement in the Philippines promoting a democratic government? Well, it's a it's a democracy. They do have elections. But what makes it is in a lot of countries where they have democracy, democracy does not work as well as it ought to, you know, there are, there, it works, but with healthy doses of repression and, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and underhand methods, you know, Ill, you see, you have to have the law, rule of the law. It's just not enough having uh, elections. You should have a free press. Uh, and only when, only when you do that, uh, that is when it, it uh, it it improves your numbers improve and I don't and I and in the Philippines that's been a uh, that's been a problem time and again I think. Okay, uh, and now moving back to China, what would be a more effective way for the United States to relate to China than in the way the U.S. is currently engaged? The U.S. seems to be more of a bully on the world stage than China is, says this uh, viewer. Uh, well, I mean, see, you know, here's the thing, you know, I mean, America looks for, tries to extract concessions from other countries, yes, but I think when you say bully, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a very, that's a, that's a high, you know, I, I try to ask myself, is it objectively true, right? Do you have an, the evidence to say that America is a bully? Uh, yes, America is a, is likes to get concessions from other countries, sometimes rich countries, sometimes uh, poor countries. You know, if, if trading that's what you mean by bully. Well, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, but how can it relate? How can America relate to China? I see. The thing is, how can you? You can. I. I think. The only way for America to relate to China is to take moral responsibility for the world. 
there's no, you cannot sit across the table and relate to China because China does not play its cards. It plays its cards close to its chess. We don't know what its long-term intentions are. When, a, when your opponent doesn't uh, reveal what his long-term intentions are, you're sitting across the table and uh, talking to him or having a negotiation with him or, you know, is useful, but it's not going to be of, uh, in, in terms of your security, it's not going to be of immense value. Uh, you know, if you want, the best thing to do for America, in my opinion, is to engage with the world morally. I think that that is what America should, Americans should talk about and America should, uh, what is the right thing to do? What must be the world like? Why, why, are the, uh, why is the liberal order not working? Why are countries poor? These are fundamental philosophical questions that, and America doesn't have to do it all by itself. It can pull in the other developed countries and it, it should start a conversation and you know, it should, this should be the focus of where things should uh, be headed. I think that the, the, when, you, when you morally engage with the world as an outcome, uh, the China problem will be uh, honestly engaged with the world. The China problem will automatically go away because you see, they, how long will, you know, they, they, when you sit across and you want to have alliances and this sort of thing that, you know, with them and they have a different perception of who they are. I, is, I don't think it's going to be uh, very fruitful overall. All right, um, and this uh, uh, viewer asks a related question. What responses are possible if China gradually becomes an irreplaceable source of minerals, technology, and other commodities, and maybe also military protection for Southeast Asia, East Asia, maybe parts of Africa, and the rest of the world? Well, I mean, you know, see, it, the, the thing is, it, China is an anonymously resourceful country. You know, it has a capacity to play a role in the world. Now, it can play a fruitful role in the world. All, all what we should be concerned about is in engaging with China, where nobody is stopping China from doing some, you know, doing. Um, Benevolent deeds or engaging in the world or doing good in the world is we what the rest of the world should be concerned about is the honor and the dignity of the nations of the world. They are, you know, they should not be characterized as barbarians. They should not see that that is what uh, the rest of the world should be concerned about China. If China wants to play a role, it's a, it's a very resourceful country. They are a very talented people. Uh, it can play, but uh, it, you know, so it, it's just that uh, we should not participate in an order in which a, peop a people should not participate in a, in a uh, political order in which they are uh, humiliated or looked down upon it's a, it's a moral thing you know so that's that is the that's what i'm trying to say here all right uh we're going to move in a different direction uh you noted at the beginning that uh, the philippines is a culturally catholic nation mm -hmm. this viewer wants to know uh, can you comment on the state of muslims in the philippines and i assume that's a muslim minority in the philippines yes there is a muslim minority in the minute they are the moros they have been up against the government they have been there was terrorism there 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 was an outfit called uh, abu saif they have been fighting and the filipino government has tried to quell them now what what duterte has done is um, America has, you know, in the war on terror, uh, immediately after the war on terror uh, started uh, in, in the Philippines, American mm, forces tried to help the Filipinos to defuse the, uh, uh, the terrorism that existed in the Philippines. Uh, so this is the, um, this is, in, and this happened in the island of, uh, you know, in the island of Mindanao. Uh, Rodrigo Duterte comes from this island and uh, he uh, he has taken a more sort of uh, benevolent uh, outlook at the Muslims. Uh, he tends to think that the Muslims are, um, you know, uh, are uh, he he wa he he wants to, he looks at them uh, rather like uh, people who can be 
who have legitimate grievances, some of these outfits, and he's trying to bring them into the mainstream. And uh, so he doesn't see, that's, that's his approach. He's not more into the fighting side of it, more into the resisting side of it. He's more into uh, co-opting and bringing them. He comes from the same island as the, uh, as the Moros come from. And uh, uh, there have been some terrorist attacks in the Philippines, unfortunately, but uh, that's what he's doing. There have been Muslims. I, I mean, I, when I said uh, Philippines is a Catholic country, what I meant is it's predominantly a Catholic country. It's not, it is not a, um, it has a minority Muslim population as well there, in the, particularly right. in the island of Mindanao. All right. Um, this question asks, does the nationalistic focus of a leader like President Trump increase the possibility of a major confrontation with China, considering Trump's lack of inter international cooperation and respect for our world allies. See, the, the Trump policy, the Trump policy is, he does not, want, he does not believe in, um, in, in multilateral institutions. Okay, he's not a great believer in it. Again, like any world leader, when you come into a political situation, unless you're really creating a revolution, when you're working, with, you have to work within existing institutions. There are already things in place there. And you cannot uh, completely uh, uh, change the world or fit it, recreate the world as you want it in a four year term or something that you become president with, uh, it's not possible. So Trump uh, does, yes, Trump does not believe in these alliances and uh, and all that, but um, he want, he is more or less an ice, sort of isolationist. He doesn't want to get into the involved in these wars. Uh, he doesn't want to, uh, you know, he's distrustful ally of allies and uh, uh, his foreign policy is to, to willing to in in trouble spots. He's willing to turn the world over to uh, questionable, morally questionable forces. Um, yeah, not everywhere. He's not willing to give uh, Crimea or Ukraine to uh, President Putin. You know, he's he's not uh, he's not telling Putin, "Come on, take us. I'll I'll move back." send your tanks in and take Eastern Europe all for yourself. No, that's not what he's saying. What He's drawing the line in such situations. Places like North Korea or places like Afghanistan, he's willing to talk with the uh, dictator in North Korea. He's willing to talk with the, um, the Taliban in Afghanistan. So he's able, he's willing to do these kinds of things because he doesn't want, you know, he doesn't take a moral, he doesn't care about, uh, you know, how they repress their people or what he does, those leaders do to their own people. He, he's not worry, worried about those kinds of things. So, yeah, you know, yes, he's, uh, I think he's uh, the Trump policy is uh, uh, is you know uh, uh, it, that's that is that has been Trump's policy really in in foreign policy. He doesn't he wants to keep the country uh, you know not fighting wars. The, so the risk of confrontation with others with with Trump being in office, you know I I don't know I I, I don't think it particularly. Trump is not going around looking for risks. He's not going around fighting wars. He doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to lose American lives. So he's not really uh, responsible for, but the, but the foreign policy establishment is really concerned about Trump because uh, he, he undermines international institutions. The, that's a, that the foreign policy community believes that's an advantage that the US has. They just don't want to give that away. So both Republicans as well as Democrats are, uh, are concerned about that. What is the nature of the threat from China? Invasion seems unlikely except possibly for Taiwan. Is it economic in nature? The disputes over islets and atolls in the South China Sea seem minor in the greater scheme of things. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's a very penetrating observation. Uh, I, 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 I agree, you know, there, what, what is, see, we, all we know is the chairman Mao has expressed 
a desire to run risks. Okay, we don't after beyond after that. He's a he's a major Chinese leader. It's still the same Communist Party that runs China, but over and above that, we don't know. Uh, you know, in Nixon's meeting with. Uh, Chairman Mao in 1971, if you go through the transcript, um, the, the meeting transcripts are all out now, you will find that uh, Chairman Mao is explicitly telling uh, Nixon, let Taiwan come after 100 years. And look at it, it's almost 50 years up. They have not clashed on Taiwan. They've been good on that. You know, yeah. uh, come 2021, February, we'd be done 50 years and they've not clashed on Taiwan. What do they get out of clashing in Taiwan? I'm not, see, some of these small islands, or Taiwan or these kinds of things does not, if anything, that'll push China, China's uh, dominance behind. It'll push China behind. Uh, you know, the trade relationship will, you know, America would add it, that'll become the Pearl Harbor. Uh, you know, they, uh, you, there was a movie uh, in the, see they are, what the establishment wants to do with respect to China is to try and do what uh, they did to Japan in the 1990s. Uh, they tried to Japanese cars were selling too you know too many cars, consumer electronics, everything was flooding the world at the time in the 80s and 70s. And uh, they want to push that back in the 90s. There was a movie that came out, Rising Sun, Sean Connery acted, Japan bashing movie. And uh, that tells you the sign of the times. Like uh, a, lot of, a lot of uh, Japanese companies, car companies had to manufacture their cars in the United States. They had to use certain num percentage of parts in the United States. I used to work in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. You know, uh, there, the semiconductor industry, they came up with a consortium called Sematech. And the reasoning behind that is they, did, they wanted to uh, be sure that, uh, you know, the patents and other things didn't go to Japan and, uh, you know, the, the Japanese are not flooding the market. So they, uh, American companies are better at making processor chips. So they, they wanted to consolidate the American gains. So that, I mean, those are, those, they're trying to, they will try to do those kinds of things with respect to China. Uh, you know, the establishment, the foreign policy establishment, uh, should Biden win? that would be the approach that they would take and they would form alliances and uh, trade agreements or whatever with other countries preferentially they'll try to curb china but will it work i, I don't i don't know because china doesn't manufacture high end goods it doesn't have a uh, you know it doesn't have an alternative supplier for the kinds of goods that it manufactures so I, i'm not sure that 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 policy is in the trade sense is going to work really so we'll have to wait and see Okay, the next question uh, refers to something that I'm not familiar with. Uh, the question is, uh, how do you evaluate uh, one uh, road, one path? And I'm wondering, is the questioner perhaps referring to the Belt and Road yeah. Initiative? Yeah, yeah, that's what, uh, that's what he seems to be uh, uh, referring to, I think. You know, I, I mean, uh, see, the, this is the China coming out. You know, they are, uh, they are trying to embrace the world. They are, uh, uh, you know, see, they are a 1.3 billion people. That's a huge number of people. And they are all unified, relatively united. They are successful. They're becoming a modern country. Uh, so this is uh, this is their uh, nationalistic uh, outpouring. I mean, they 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 want to see uh, you know they 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 want to uh, bring the world together and uh, do their bit. And they have surplus money and they are spending it on all these kinds of things. I think you know. I, I mean, I in themselves by themselves, none of these things are uh, are are significant. As I said, uh, nothing that China does now is really particularly worrisome as such, except that the economy is very large and uh, big and it's growing, uh, you know, uh, it's, will they run risks? What do they want to, what, what are they looking for to, you know, I mean, I, I think it's more the case that the world will shape China than China shaping the world, you know, uh, but how it gets played out and how, uh, who, takes the leadership and who uh, uh, 
uh, how events get uh, sequenced. That's uh, that's that's not up to us, really. Um, we're running out of time. Uh, I, I believe we have time for just one more question, and I do apologize for those who had questions that we were not able to reach. Uh, there were a lot of good questions for this event. Yes, Before absolutely. I go to the last question, I just want to remind people, come back next week, same time next week. We're going to hear Dr. Todd Lefko talk on a very interesting topic, climate change and the global order. Don't miss it. But finally, our final question for today, in your opinion, what provocation would bring China to use nuclear weapons in its own backyard, so to speak? Oof. Well, that's, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, uh, they do have nuclear weapons. They do have nuclear weapons that can reach the United States for some time now and they can have many weapons that can be used in their backyard. Uh, we, you know, um, I remember reading uh, Mao saying uh, he hopes that nuclear weapons will not be used. Uh, so I'm, I'm just thinking whether China will be, uh, will rely on using the nuclear, will, you know, uh, will use the nuclear weapons first or something, you know, he, I don't know. I don't know what the present leadership, I, I mean, I, they may not see this is a very difficult question to answer. See, we, particularly with the people who are as taciturn as the Chinese are in terms of their long-term objectives, will they use a nuclear? See, I, the one thing I could say is China will not want to destroy the world. You see, China will not want to destroy the world. It is not in business to destroy the world. It is, you know, it has to make just by all I'm saying is just by being a making a prerogative of uh, of being uh, the preeminent nation is not sufficient. It has to make a contribution of some sort to the world. And, uh, and you know, in what fashion it will make and how the world will respond to it, uh, that interplay is going to determine what the outcome is going to be. But it's a in the recent past, it's a phenomenal success story. There's no question about that at all. All right, well, on that note, I think we're going to have to draw this uh, program to a close. Uh, we wanna thank you very much, uh, Kanan Soliapan, thank for you a very most much. interesting presentation. And I look forward to seeing everyone back again next week for Dr. Todd Lefko. Oh, thank you th very much. Thank you, Judy. Uh, tell my thanks to Greg and uh, Vivian. I think you've been a fantastic team to work with, you know, preparations, advanced preparations. I've never, I've done these talks many places, but uh, you guys were the most thorough of the lot. Uh, thank you very much. You did a very good job. And thanks again to the audience. I'm sorry we didn't sure. get all the questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.